thank you, Kathleen. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. This has, um, again, been a really amazing conference with three really different and, and really interesting speakers. But for those of you who have attended these in the past, you know that when we get to this point in the evening, because I've been taking notes and not sleeping in my chair, there, there's, there are usually certain themes that I think that emerge that are not necessarily directly related to the title of what we're talking about. So I want to start with this, and I'm going to say to each of you something that each of you said um, during the course of your presentations, because I think that one could look at them all as being interrelated in, in, in some way. So Sir James, at one point, and again, I'm paraphrasing because I'm you know, typing as quickly as I can while I'm listening to all of you. Um, but Sir James, when you were talking about, uh, in the context of, of uh, JP2 and his letter to artists, you, you made the comment to the effect of um, that modernity says that I do not need mercy or redemption. Um, James, you noted that um, a mature and contrite realization of our own imperfections is needed. Um, and Sandy, you noted that kindness and self-effacement are signs of a will to die, not a will to live. So it's interesting that all three of you have, in effect, advocated positions that are the antithesis of the culture that we live in, which is obsession with the self, right? Um, in work, in the way that we treat other people. Um, why do you think it is that we have ended up where we are now in the sense of everyone is, look at me, look at me, look at me all the time, and it's about promoting the self, it's about being your best self, living your best life, right, as people like to say on social media, and not about helping other people to live their best lives or to do their best work. It's, it's always about the me and not about either the we or about the you. So I will start with you since you were the keynote speaker. Well, <clears throat> I think there is a, 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 a a kind of obnoxious egotism at the heart of much um, contemporary culture, uh, the arts uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and associated connections, that disappears once a, an artist realises that there is a higher goal to serve. And <coughs> it's... I'm, being very, I'm quite careful about what I'm saying here because uh, the, the, when a composer writes for an audience, yes, of course, the ego, if you like, has to play a part. The, the personality kicks in. Uh, one wants to express something of one's personality, one's own uh, self in the music. However, if that composer has, had, has ever had an experience of liturgy, Mm. The ego disappears and a new mindset or soul set kicks in. Uh, uh, one realises if one writes for liturgy uh, that one is not just serving the goals of entertainment or high art um, or showing off one's great skills as a, uh, a manipulator of notes on the page, uh, but that there, there is a, a huge responsibility on the, the part of the composer uh, for his music, for his or her music, to serve the praying person. Mm. Uh, that is, um, whether whether the music is for the congregation or not, and usually it isn't in my case, it's, it's, it's choral music or instrumental music. That music has to be fashioned in such a way that allows the, the prayers and contemplations of the praying person to be carried to the altar of God. And that is a huge uh, change in the um, uh, understanding of what music and culture is all about. Um, can that be transferred into the world of the concert hall? Uh, perhaps it can. And um, the, perhaps the, the great experience of, of serving the liturgy can actually make you a better composer when it comes to serving the, the secular world too. Mm. I mean, you know, James, your profession is not one known for its humility. No. Um, no. So it is interesting that that, that was a topic that you that you picked up on as well, in the same sense that Sir James is talking about with a sense of, I'm doing something that is going to be used by other people, 
right? That it's it isn't just about me, you know. And 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 the the music that I'm writing, whether it's in a liturgical setting or whatever, it's supposed to be lifting people outside of themselves. And you are doing the physical place in which that is, in theory, supposed to be happening, right? Yeah. It's a very good observation. Here. Well, yeah. and, the, it, and perhaps it's it's overly obvious, but in the sense of, you know, if 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 you have you know if you have someone who is is designing a building, uh, you know, or or a monument or, or or whatever it is that isn't really about the person, for example, no. Frank Gehry, um, no, well, because well, all yeah. Frank Gehry's buildings are about Frank Gehry. They're not about whatever this, else. That this they're is the warning for. that that I and my uh, compatriots in Washington gave ad nauseum to uh, the decision makers on Capitol Hill and, and, and to the Eisenhower family for the Eisenhower Memorial designed by Frank Geary. And we warned them that it would be known as the Geary Memorial. Right. And in fact, that's what it is. That is what it is. Because yes. he designed it to be exactly that. Yeah. And when it stopped being about him, because ultimately the, the city and the government just hammered him so hard that he eventually just walked away from it when he realized it was no longer going to be in a, mo a memorial to him then he th then he abandoned the project so yeah. he now refuses to have his name associated with it even well, it's though it's not on it even though everyone <laughs> calls it the Gary Memorial <laughs> too late right, now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so that's a yeah. kind of a funny funny right. thing yeah um but no uh humility is a very difficult thing for architects and it's a very difficult thing for me i struggle with it um, and putting me up on a stage like this is uh, <laughs> is not the least bit helpful. To my <laughs> um, but no, I think honestly, it's 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 what I was talking about today, and and in that sense, it was more of not more, but it was also a personal reflection for me, mm -hmm. for which I thanked uh, the institute for the opportunity to also remind myself that this is what I am up to, right? Yeah. And not up to what Gary's up to, for example. Um, no, it's for, the, it's, it's for the church. It's something you give it all back, right? What, what, what am I going to do with this, right? Right. So you give it back. Right. No, exactly. Well, and Sandy, you're not, you know, you're not building ginormous Golgothas in your backyard, so far as I know. Right. I mean, you're building them for other people who are people of faith or, or people who have, you know, a particular uh, thing that they want to celebrate that that isn't mu they're they're not they're not that giant Constantine statue that you showed in or the fragments of it that you showed in your, your, your slide. And the fact that you pointed out during your talk, the difference between, for example, Christianity and, and some other religions, the idea that there is a death to self that has to take place there. Right. That's one of the great problems. Is it all right? Is it working the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. One of the great problems that people, uh, it's one of the great superstitions of the modern world that the sculptor or, or indeed architect yeah. who is a gar gargantuanist, like, well, you know, will be an egomaniac. Right. It does sometimes happen. But if you look at the truth of this, let's think of the most famous statue in the world, the Statue of Liberty, so called. Do we really know the name of the sculptor? You'd have thought, of, of all sculptures, that would be the one which was author, author. Right. Right? But it's not. Nobody has heard of Bartholdi, except me. But I'm a geek. Right? <laughs> so, and, and, oh, then, and no. then you think, uh, think, well, think of Mount Rushmore himself, it, itself. Right. I mean, who has heard the name Gutzen Borglum? Right. It's gone. Right. So there's something about the monument that obliterates the identity of his maker if it is sufficiently powerful and dedicated beyond its maker. Mm. Borglum was asked by Senator Berry of South Dakota if he would sign the monument <laughs> with a big graphic signature, you know, <laughs> three times the height of this building. And he said absolutely not, because this would completely ruin the whole preternatural nature of the thing and make it come crashing down to earth with the call of author, author. Mm. Right, you go to South America and you go to the big one, what's the city with the Jesus above it? Oh, Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do we know the name of that sculptor? Landowski, a French Polish. Again, it's an amazing thing. Now, we've got a stupid piece of sculpture in Britain called the Angel of the North. Mm. You might have heard of this. Yeah. 
And um, Gormley. It's in, yeah, you see, that's the point. Everybody knows it's a Gormley. Yeah, yeah. It's, you see, it's a big angel. Well, it's not, because we all know what an angel looks like, even though we've never seen one. That's weird. So, <laughs> True. It's, True. A, it's a sort of stooky figure with two wings sticking out of it. It should be called the Birdman of the North. <laughs> Except it's in the north of England, so we call it the Angel of the South. <laughs> and then, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and then the, the the people in Carlisle call it the Angel of the East, and the folk in Denmark call it the Angel of the the West. West. <laughs> the poor folk in Gateshead that have to suffer the monster, they call it the Angel of the Here. <laughs> but in fact, it's not an angel at all. It should be called the Gormley of the There. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> because above all things, it is a Gormley. Now, we work in our way quite differently from that. I would like to hope that I've never made a stoddart in my life. Mm. And one of the ways of doing this is to become a stylist. Mm. Make, art, make monuments of different styles. So I've made neoclassical works. I've made heroic realist works. I've made domestic realism. I've done some art deco work, art nouveau work even. And in this way, you fail to gain a style of your own. Mm. And that is a step towards redemption. So no one says, let's go see the stoddart. At on, Princeton. On the, on the mile. No. Or, the, or at Princeton. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In the old days in Princeton, before the statue of John Witherspoon was up, everybody used to meet at, at the Henry Moore. Mm. And now mm -hmm. Witherspoon went up. Which one? And they're all meeting at Witherspoon. Yeah. yeah. They're not meeting at the Stoddart. They've never heard of me. <laughs> and that continue. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the first work I ever did for the church... Uh, is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it's a small chapel, seats 70 people. The bishop commissioned it for Eucharistic adoration. And um, I designed into the interior elevations in the sanctuary the need for a large, large mural. And what the mural should be, I have no idea, and I had no idea. But I knew that we would find the right artist, and then working with him or her, it would be... Uh, uh, the right piece for mm. the for the uh, chapel, and then eventually we did find uh, it was it was Leonard Porter, um, and we found him and he painted it and I was there when he in installed it and I helped him install it. It was late at night, and I said, you know, Leonard, having designed this beautiful chapel, everyone's going to talk about the painting, not the architecture, and not the architecture, and that's and that's the way it should be. Yeah, no, that's he, a good la point. he la we both laughed together. Yeah. But it's still the case. People yeah. say, oh, did you design that chapel with the painting in it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. You have it. You, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, in a sense, it's a giant frame. Yeah. Right? That's is, exactly. is what you're talking about. It's a about. setting. It's a for, setting for... For art to communicate the truth. Right. Into faith. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems... And, Sir James, one thing that, that you, had, you had talked about in your talk that I thought was interesting, and it's, it's, it's something that really only comes in after, well, maybe not, you might disagree with me, that only comes in after the French Revolution is the idea that the kind of, in modern and contemporary composition, there's a lot of foreboding, there's a lot of um, reflecting of violence, there's a lot of reflecting of uncertainty and so on. And when, if you look at music before that, for lack of a better word, it's dance music, right? I mean, apart from the sacred, obviously, but you know, Vivaldi, Haydn, Handel, Mozart, it's dance music, it's party music, right? And admittedly, they were having a great time, but they were also all killing each other over religion, and they all had the plague, and they, you know, got invaded by the Turks periodically, and, you know, like, th bad things were going on. So why isn't that reflected in sort of pre-1789 music and the way that it is after? Well, something something happened uh, with the onset of romanticism in, in music. That's when the the ego kicked in, and yeah. th there's many of those composers. And I've mentioned a few today in the talk, like Wagner and Mahler and Elgar and so on, whose music I love very much. Uh, but certainly, something entered the bloodstream of the musical imagination um, after Beethoven uh, that allowed uh, the individual to be to to express. 
um, not just darker thoughts and darker reflections, nothing wrong with that, of course, um, but, but allowed the ego to fly off in very strange directions that seem to forget about the communitarian roots of music making. Yeah. Uh, um, th those communitarian roots were still strong right up until Beethoven uh, with the likes of uh, Haydn and, and Mozart and, of course, Handel and, and Bach and, and the great uh, Baroque composers writing music for their community. Yeah. Um, and music of their community, as it were, and that communitarian link uh, has dissolved uh, in some way or another and perhaps needs to be reinvented, not just in a way that um, mimics the past or pastiches the past, but to find a compo for a composer to re-find, rediscover his, uh, his or her um, usefulness to his community is, is an imperative. Yeah, and uh, uh, I don't want to blow the trumpet for the Brits, but there's been something in about the British composer experience that ha has maintained that, perhaps more so than our uh, mainland European uh, colleagues. Uh, that that right through the 20th century, um, and and it was the 20th century where where British music did come to into a, 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 a deep and. Uh, flowering fru fruition. Uh, nevertheless, those composers who, who mark that trend in music n uh, always saw their role in the, their community as vital, going right back to the likes of Vaughan Williams, uh, who um, used hymns and uh, collected hymns, old f folk songs, re-engaging with the folk tradition. Uh, that was, of course, happening in places like Hungary with Bartok and Kodai as well. Um, uh, but that that idea that a composer like Vaughan Williams wanted to give back to the people he came from mm. uh, has carried on in the British tradition so that uh, after him came Benjamin Britten who set up the Aldborough Festival and wrote some of his greatest masterpieces for children to perform such yeah. as Neuer's Flood and so on. Um, music for local choirs, amateur choirs, uh, that was carried on by the likes of Michael Tippett who wrote music for workers collectives and so on from a left wing position. Uh, and, and on it goes, Peter Maxwell Davis, who was a great mentor of mine, set up a festival in the Orkney Islands, which placed the community at that part of it, and he wrote music for that community. Mm. And um, there seems to be something in the, the, the water, as it were, that still sees that as important. Uh, and I think that is something that, even although we, we can still have not just dark thoughts, but very specific, abstract musical ideas in our minds, we still want to be part of our own world and yes. to, to serve that world uh, either in a, co a communal, social and indeed a liturgical and religious fashion for some yeah. of us too. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, and I think, in, I think in each of your fields, when you're talking about we'll find the right artist for this chapel in, in South Dakota, this particular music festival is taking place in Cornwall, let's say. So like it's going to reference, you know, perhaps, you know, music from that area. Um, you're you're not building, you know, monuments on the Royal Mile to, you know, people who don't have anything to do with Edinburgh, just to, ju you know, just for the sake of putting something up. I mean, it's something that the community presumably wants. It's right? not public art. Public art is generally speaking private art taken out of the white wall gallery and thrust into the face well, of poor yes. suffering people. That's I true. I was going to ask Jimmy a minute. You talk about romanticism as inaugurating an egotism, uh, you know, possibly. And we take the case of Richard Wagner. Wagner actually had quite a, 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 a sophisticated angle in this. He, he was an extraordinarily communitarianly minded person, community minded person. And there is a school of thought that believes that Wagner was imagining the music drama, not the opera, he hated opera, grand opera. He wanted the music drama as to be based upon uh, ancient Greek models of tragedy, which would be experienced by all the community with the importance and pressure on the community of the religious nature mm. of antique um, you know, theatre. Yeah. It's, it's part of the cult of Dionysus. Yeah. And his erstwhile colleague, Friedrich Nietzsche, actually wrote more or less for Wagner his first book, The Birth of Tragedy which is to do with the idea of, of looking at the drama and the cult of Dionysus is coming together. And this is written for feeding to Wagner when Nietzsche was one of Wagner's acolytes. 
Then Wagner, well, Nietzsche chucked Wagner because you've got to chuck your master. And he went away to Sils Maria, so many thousand metres above Bayreuth. Mm. But even Bayreuth itself was understood to be a people's festival. Right. They made great plans for this. You know, yeah. um, but, of course, it was stocked entirely with aristocrats, as it is today. Right. And you just can't get in there. Yeah. So I think there's something in Wagner's romanticism that bucks the trend. If you take a romantic like Szymanowski, Polish composer, or Scriabin, yeah. these guys are really uh, solipsistic. Yeah. They're going into a zone of extreme esoter esotericism. Yes. They're all deriving from Wagner's basic yeah. thrust. Right. But they don't have the communitarian spirit. No. I think one of the great problems in, in the Romantic movement is to identify the actual core of this. Wagner is called a great egotist. He's a, he's, he's, he's a, his musicians were very pleased with him. He fought terribly hard for their rights. And he was always a left winger, of course, when he was in politics. You know, to the end of his days, his politics were left wing. But um, I think the start of the egotism thing is really with Friedrich Nietzsche. And you know, he's the, the artist, the, the poet, philosopher, who writes in his last book, Eki Homo, ironically enough, Eki yeah, Homo, yeah. chapter titles such as, Why I Am So Great. <laughs> Why I Am Never Wrong. <clears throat> yeah. Why right. I Am A Destiny. Right. Who writes to the Pope and signs himself Nietzsche Caesar. Yeah. You see, and then his last words in, is a continent and individual. Have I not been understood? I am not a man, but dynamite. Right. Now, this is hyper egotism, and he believes in it. The tragedy with well, Nietzsche. Well, he was also bonkers. But yeah. I mean, but, but, it's, but, it's, it's but, the simplest but, talking. But, yeah. Well, maybe, but, the, uh, but his trade in stock is, is words, it's, it's text. Oh, yes, right? of course, yes. And it's and, thrilling. And text. Wagner's is music. Yes. So I wonder that, uh, it, it, it's certainly the case that. Say for Wagner, for example, and I'm not an expert at all, but it's it's possible for someone to say and believe and vote yeah. and support, uh -huh. but then also have have this insidious romanticism in one's work, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. And yeah. I don't. That's I, true. Put that question to you. I'm, yeah. But, so, I'm I'm always one for well, what what's what what's on the wall, mm -hmm. right? And what or what's in the field, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. And uh, that's for me the proof in the pudding because he's going to croak, yes. right? And and the thing will survive. Yes. Well, the yeah. thing will survive, but it's also a question of, you know, if, if we're thinking about the idea of virtue, right, if we're thinking about the idea of virtue in, in all of the arts, you know, music, architecture, the plastic arts, you know, even, you know, literature, etc. Um, how do you create something in one of those fields that even though it's idiosyncratic, right, because it's, it's that particular artist's take of whatever, as you say, you find in the field, um, and not somebody else's. Where is that line between I'm serving my community and I'm serving myself? Like, how do you discern where that distinction lies? Well, first of all, I, I think uh, back, getting back to Wagner, he, he was certainly a man of the left. He, he stood in the barricades in 1848, along with Bakunin, uh, uh, who eventually had such a massive impact on the Russian Revolution. and and. We can forgive him that, perhaps, but it, but it was because he did see uh, music as a as a means of making a better society. He wanted society to be better. He wanted people to be better. If he, he was here tonight, tonight, he would be agreeing with with uh, the argument that um, um, uh, that that art and music um, could aid the the, the case or the, the power of virtue. Mm. He saw himself as virtuous, and uh, who, who are we to disagree? I suppose, in some ways, um, and, and then later in life, you know, he, he became fascinated with the kind of things that we've been talking about today. That, that is uh, religion. He was unconventionally religious and, and uh, quite hostile to the Catholic Church, especially. Yeah. But but his experience of having made his first communion and uh, first. Com uh, co uh, his confirmation never left him and he wanted he saw his own work as deeply religious and in fact My Michael Tanner uh, you probably know is um, one of the great uh, Vig Vignerian commentators describes Tristan and Isolde as one of the two greatest religious works ever written mm. the other one being this back St. Matthew Passion so what is religious about Tristan and Isolde uh, which is an, a pagan story right 
um, uh, and and in many ways um, overtly secular yeah. uh, and er- erotic and all the rest of it. And in fact, the, the answer lies in with Roger Scruton, this wonderful book I, 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 I quoted from or referenced earlier, Trist- um, Death Devoted Heart, Sex and the Sacred mm-hmm. in uh, Tristan and Isolde. And ma- he makes the case that this is a deeply theological work um, and, and a work in spite of all the composer's flaws, and we are, we are all flawed and fallen, uh, has has um, contributed a huge uh, gift to mankind. The, the 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 results of which and the impact of which may not be fully appreciated for generations or indeed centuries yet to come. Yeah, no, that's very that's a very good point. I feel like I feel like a lot of what all of you who work in creative fields have to do is. In a sense, you're doing it all of it on spec. I mean, someone's paying you to do it, obviously, because you have a contract and someone says, I need you to deliver whatever this thing is by a certain amount of time within a certain amount of budget. But in terms of, is this going to have resonance down the road? Is this going to be meaningful to people down the road? You can't know that now. I mean, 100 years from now, perhaps all of your work will be toppled. Perhaps all of your you know, buildings will be torn down. No one will perform your music. You don't know that, right? But you do it anyway, right? And you, yes, and you have to try to make it ancient, I think. Mm. So that it will, so they will not be tearing it down. Yeah. Right? This is why when I make a bronze statue, we pre-patinate it with a verdigris, a green-gray, so that people won't notice that it's new. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a young man being introduced to a London club. Yeah. The gentleman's club. Yeah. He puts on a jacket and a tie, a pair of flannels and a decent pair of shoes, and he sits down quietly in the Chesterfield, reads the paper and doesn't make a fuss. Whereas with public art, the artist is desperate to impose himself upon the world. Yeah. It's like the same young man going in wearing Bermuda shorts with his earphones on, making a nuisance of himself. At my statue of James Clark Maxwell, it was very interesting. The Royal Society of Edinburgh commissioned it, and it's just in the same block as where their offices are. The RSE was having a, co- a physics conference, uh, and some Chinese delegation was over, very distinguished. And there was a pause in the proceedings, and the, the statue's about a three-minute walk, less. And so the man, the secretary said, why don't you go along and see our new statue of James Clark Maxwell? So off they went. You can see it from the door. See? And they, they came back and they said they couldn't find it because they'd <laughs> had the concept new in their mind, oh, which, right. which linked up with a certain mental percept. Right. Which means... Yes, it, right? Okay. right, exactly. You know, something yes. looking really weird. Yes. And shiny. And shiny, and, and, right. Yes, and, yeah. and, and brown. Right. You see, so... Or, or mad looking. Right. So here's a statue that looks as though it's been there for about 140 years, possibly. Yeah. And it's ignored. And this is what we like. This is what we aim for. Yeah. You see? And that's, we, we falsely make it old to save it from the world. Yes. Also, when you, when you clean up a statue, then all the pigeons fly to it. <laughs> because just like you, they want to use a very clean toilet. You know? <laughs> so it's better oh, to, you're saying it's better to pass on notice so that you don't get pooped exactly. on. Exactly. Well, it's Epicurus said this, you know, the great philosopher, his great injunction to us all, live unknown. Yeah. yeah. If only we could all embrace that, then we'd be a lot happier. Right. But we have to be known because we have a job to do. Yes. Our job is there, and it takes on the public profile. As, as an architect and, and as a professor, I encourage myself and my students to go and find very good buildings that no one else would recognize as very good buildings. And they're out there, mm. right? Right. They're, they're modest, well done, well designed. It's just that they were not commissioned to be standouts. Right. But they were designed by very capable architects, and they're there. And they're what's called background buildings, and so many of them are wonderful, wonderful. So right. I want, I would like that to be in my portfolio. I'd be happy to, for that to be in my portfolio. I would like that, uh, to design a building like that, that sort of thing. And there's a whole bunch of 
buildings like that, works of art like that, and people like well, that. Well, and certainly, and people also like musical compositions as well. I mean, yes. not everything has to be one of the war horse, you know, symphonies in order for it to have meaning. I mean, you were talking about, you know, Alexander Scrabin before, and I used to have to do his piano exercises when I studied piano. And they're the most intricate, I mean, they're, they're boring to listen to, but, but to sit down and create all of these exercises for himself, right, to strengthen his hands so that he could play better, and for other, you know, keyboard players to be able to, to, to play really well. He wasn't going to, you know, fill a concert hall by writing that, but he did it because he's like, you know, this is really good for me and I can share this with other people and it will help them to become, you know, more proficient at, you know, at, at playing a keyboard instrument. So I'm assuming that there must be smaller scale things that, that you either like to perform or that you've written yourself that you don't intend to fill, you know, the Royal Albert Hall, you know, with people coming to listen to, to sort of a shorter, smaller piece that you may have written, right? Yes, uh, I yeah. mean, I, 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 the, the comment you made about Grieg's little piano pieces earlier resonated with me. Mm. Uh, we've just come back from friends in Vermont, uh, one who is a, a, an incredible pianist, and he plays, he plays a number of my little pieces, but there's a little piece of mine that he plays called Angel, and it, there's hardly anything to it at all. It's just a series of notes, uh, rather etoliolated and... Um, sparse and um, and it just lasts for as long as you want it to last and he loves playing it and and I was I, I'm delighted about this you know there's um, sometimes the understatement works and uh, uh, I, I, th I think that's a, it's a big a, a big lesson to learn uh, for, for a composer there, there has been a trend in recent uh, decades um, certainly through the 20th century of writing very very complex scores um, and taking a great sort of almost macho pride, and it's usually men uh, that write these uh, scores, uh, in its ultra virtuosity and its, uh, its near impossibility to play. And it looks very, very uh, complicated and dark and black and covered in notes and not just notes but instructions to how these play, play these notes. Yeah. And this was uh, a great trend and fashion in, in modern music, um, Boulez and Stockhausen, I mentioned them earlier, pursued this. And there was a, a young composer friend of mine um, told me he, he submitted a piece, uh, a, a, a much simpler piece for a competition. And he, his, the feedback from the judges in this competition was that his music doesn't look good on paper. <laughs> uh, nothing, nothing to do with what it sounded like. Maybe, no. maybe they couldn't actually tell. Um, yeah. But the fact that right. it wasn't as as um, packed with, yeah. with incident right. made it a lesser piece than you know, a little Grieg piano miniature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, does 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 every you know does every beautiful church have to be as as uh, elaborate as where we had mass today? Because I I would say no. No, and right? I take my students on walks and I say, okay, now pick out the building that was designed by an architect. Ah. And, and they don't know what I mean. They're young. and yeah. so, so, so Just keep thinking about the question and let's look down this street. Right. There's one building that certainly was designed by an architect. Yeah. Eventually, you'll all know what it is. Yeah. Let me know when you're ready. Yeah. And they have uh, five minutes, three minutes, two minutes. Th there it is. It's yeah. that one. Now why? Yeah. Right. And one of the ways I put it to them is it's too many moves per, per, per square foot. <laughs> right, which is which is analogous right. to your notes right, on exactly. The page, yeah, right? yeah. This yeah. concerto has too many notes. Yeah, right. <laughs> I had a major, yeah. I had a major commission sitting right here. I was sitting in the living room with this couple, very bright, very very astute uh, folks. They collect major major works of Dutch ma masters still lives. Yeah, these are very bright people. And the fellow asked me the the million dollar question. He said, so. What is, as, as our architect, if we hire you, what is your approach to your relationship to the work? Hmm. And no one had ever asked me this. I was very young. And it came to me and I said, uh, it would, I want to design the house for you so that on the third afternoon, the afternoon of the third day, it might occur to your guests to ask who the architect was. 
Mm. And he smiled and said, you're hired. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it just sort of came to me because it's, it's really the right attitude. Yes. It's just like, it, it's not. Really is this, I'm, I'm it, telling you, this is the theme all three of you have I said I want to make buildings. I don't want to make the, me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. that you want to do yeah. the work and you want to, to, you know, make sure that it's well done. It's yeah. not, it's not about yourselves. Yeah. Sandy, since sculpture is worse than murder, and you have been persecuted for your classicism, this can actually apply to all of you, um, why do you persevere? Um, it's not what I do, <coughs> it's what I am. Sorry. It's not what I do, sculpture, it's what I am. Yeah. And I'll be doing it until my dying day, Yeah. if I ever live that long. <laughs> Uh, Let me know if you do. <laughs> so it's an existential imperative. Uh. I'm, I'm really, I mean, what I was really doing was, and, and the, 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 so, the, the root of the crime was that I was in diplomatic, I, I had kept diplomatic channels open to the dead. Mm. That's really the fundamental problem that I had in my career. That, uh, you know, the dead being the last unemancipated social group. Yeah. Which is remarkable because we were all dead before we were born. Then we have 70 years of nonsense, <laughs> which we do everything we regret. <laughs> and then we die and we return to what we were. And the great thing about culture is that it's a tripartite relationship. Mm. There's three parties involved in this. There is us, the living, of course. And then on the other side, as you might say, in the noumenon, you've got the dead. And as Roger Scruton pointed out, they've got metaphysical companions over there. It's yet to be born. And the yet to be born and the dead, who are in the same zone, come and feed our phenomenal existence. Mm. And it passes through like that. It's a tripartite arrangement. Mm. And if you have that, then you have culture. The great, and, and the, of course, the great problem is that you have to factor in your own demise. Yes. Now, the great life affirmative age, inaugurated by Nietzsche, the age which says it's me it's all yes. about me right and we don't care about the past that's gone right and we don't care about the future really not the, the not the tele future the distant future because like the past and like the distant future i won't be there so right. what's the so point what of relevance it? does it have exactly. yeah 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 so this is what make the fundamental division between the person that is prepared to be ritually slaughtered on occasion <laughs> because you're what you're doing is you're following the categorical imperative yeah i'm doing it because i ought yeah because you ought to i yeah, must discharge exactly a duty right. yeah. yeah no totally totally i mean is it is it the same thing with with music as well are the things that you perhaps could get to do if you were less yourself i suppose right if you were trying to be someone else or you were trying to be what you think other people want you to be there have been phases of that in the last uh, few decades. It's much more open now, thankfully. Um, the uh, the rigours of high modernism have dissipated somewhat. Mm. And um, I look with uh, encouragement. Uh, but, but, you know, there's a chaos in, 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 in the pluralism around us. We've got to sort of fight our way much more carefully through it. But, you know, th there is a encouragement there for, for the new, new generations of composers to be themselves. Yeah. But the, 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 the temptation by the, the high priests of modernism, if you like, who's, who's still there in, in uh, newspapers and magazines and, and writing criticism, they still want to control the agenda. And I always remember, um, there's, there's one particular review, I don't remember the substance of it, it just this tiny little sub-phrase, I think it was The Guardian actually. Um, it was, it, his music is undoubt, undoubtedly beautiful, but. Right. And it was that <laughs> but that was the... Uh, the tell all. Uh, well, that, that is actually a nice way to, to get the second question that we have from the audience, which I'm going to direct to James. Um, the idea that, and, and you can extend this beyond architecture. Um, when you have, um, if you have liturgical architecture that is supposed to be avoiding fashions, for lack of a better term, and that it's, it's supposed to be something that's timeless. And you, you talked about this 
when you were giving examples of, of your work, right? That you're supposed to be able to come in here and it's sort of, it's 1175 or it's, you know, 2022. It's not, it's, it, it, it doesn't really, you know, uh, whether it's Bruno Leschi or whoever it is. Um, how, how do you see the integration of contemporary, of what's going on around us now into that notion, the notion that you're creating something that, as Sandy, you said earlier, is supposed to last kind of beyond the 70 odd years that we're going to have here. Is there a way that you can draw on what's going on now, or is it just all garbage and you can't actually do anything that's going on now? Well, much of it is garbage, right? Yeah. But um, you can scrounge around and find some good morsels, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and um, modernist architecture has uh, this rude claim on steel and glass and concrete as if these are new materials. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Really absurd. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, well, uh, and the same and the same for your colleagues, right? Yeah. The, the symphony oh, was not invented yeah. last week. Nothing new under the sun. People have been making bronze statues for thousands of years, <laughs> right? But but so. there are but there are I, mean, I must say there 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 is a modernist conception of space, if you will, mm -hmm. and and the human beings, the created human beings, uh, a relationship to that space. Yeah, that is interesting. I don't think it's ultimately contributive, but it is interesting and. In in times and in places can be useful. Yeah, um, it's it's sort of one of those ingredients that you're one of those um, spices that you have in your drawer uh, that you can use from time to time and it's appropriate and it makes things nice, right? But I think ultimately that's the sum total of the contribution. But because those spices are available, we ought to. Um, avail ourselves of them and uh, not ignore them and not ignore them not at all otherwise it's just meat and potatoes right yeah and it's 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 you know very nice to have couscous for example right <laughs> um, yes so right um I, I, it's it's difficult but when one is fluent in and capable with uh your own cuisine yes right? Then right. you have the confidence and the ability to welcome new things into it. Right. And so if you are actually engaged in the time and in the community in which you live, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to reference it all the time. Not at all. But that you are, you're sculpting, you're composing, you're designing things now. Yeah. Not a thousand years ago. Right. And you, you have to be in the now. You can't live right. in a make-believe sort of I mean, past. I suppose that John Cage has something that could be brought in, right? I don't know, but I suppose perhaps. Right? Um, but precious little, right? <laughs> but, but still, there might be something to it. <laughs> there might be something to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like how that I deflected that. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, we, we'll let Sir James have the last word. Well, there's another chapter there. Uh, in the, uh, but just to, I mean, I almost brought it up today in my speech, but um, uh, John Cage went to study with Schoenberg mm. because he saw in Schoenberg a fellow mystic. They were both obsessed with silence. And you're probably aware that John Cage's most famous, perhaps most notorious piece is this th uh, thing called 433. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of provocation to our listening uh, f sensibilities or lack of them. Four minutes, 33 seconds of silence. Uh, and the idea is that there's no such thing as silence, but things happen within that. Well, the original title of that piece was Silent Prayer. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Game, set, match. All right. Thank you, gentlemen.